Everyone else was so used to me being in that safe corporate role, just like they were, that they were like, don't do this. It's not, it's, it's too, too risky. And at this stage in your life, do you really want to start again? Whenever someone says, you can't do this, or you're not gonna do well at it, it drives me even more so. And I wanna prove that actually you, you're wrong. There's more in me than you think. You have to be willing to look at your weaknesses and then either grow in that area or employ in that area. It's very useful to bring in somebody who's going to help you be more objective about that. It's great if you have a business that's making you money, but it's no, there's no point if it doesn't then give you the freedom to enjoy the things that you want to and achieve outside of that as well. And so how do you get those boundaries? I do this thing called the deathbed thinking. Deathbed thinking, what's that? So I want to know when I'm on my deathbed, whatever decision I've made at this point makes me proud when I'm lying there saying my goodbyes. I want to leave knowing that I've left something good in the world with a whole bunch of people that are better because of what I've been able to help them do. I wasn't doing that in banking, let's be honest. <laughs> so as much as I enjoyed it, this was something that was like calling to my soul. Tej, thank you so much for being here. You're so welcome. For those people who are just getting to know you today, can you tell us a bit about yourself? There's a lot to tell in 40 years. <laughs> Uh, but yes, I'm 40. I have two children. Um, I come from a very corporate background, you know, typical Asian upbringing. Um, and now I basically operate in the world of fitness. Tell me, how did you start in fitness? What got you into it in the first place? Not the most pleasant of experiences, to be honest. Um, I had postnatal depression after my son was born. And I'd heard, like, this is going to sound like such a random story, but I, in my teens, there was a talk show um, with a woman called Trish and she had suffered with depression and she constantly told people that it was, you know, exercising that had got her through that. And that had always stuck in the back of my mind. And so when I had postnatal depression, I was like, the only way I'm going to avoid medication is to start getting physical. And for someone who hated <laughs> exercise my whole life, it was a big, big thing. Um, but this was for my mental health. There was no sort of option for me but to do that if I wanted to avoid medication. So you hadn't really done fitness beforehand? N well, obviously school, sports, yes, but I'd still be that person that was writing um, fake notes to my teachers about not being able to attend a PE class or something. So it wasn't a natural thing for me at all. So how did you kind of start your learning in fitness and thinking what would be the right types of exercises for you? I just started YouTube home videos, uh, literally just at home, bodyweight exercises. And as I started enjoying myself, actually feeling really good about myself, I started exploring what else I could do. And where did you kind of go from there? So I then decided that I didn't want to sort of do it at home. And the gym was all all too scary for me. And I, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that will resonate. I have a lot of clients that come to me with exactly the same fear. So I started um, kickboxing classes. Um, but that, that was a double pronged situation because I had just gone back to work after my son and locally there'd been a sexual assault at a train station um, late at night and I was back to doing socials after work and things like that. So I would come home quite late and I thought, oh my gosh, like I don't want anything to happen. But if it did, I want to know that I can protect myself. Yeah. So if I'm going to get physical, let's try something that will actually give me some basis behind being able to protect myself. Yeah. yeah. So kickboxing was that second foray into fitness and I absolutely fell in love with it. How did you feel fitness impacted some of those symptoms of your postnatal depression? I wouldn't say they went away overnight <laughs> at all. It took consistency. So I realized I felt much less tired after my first sort of exercise session um, and I slept better. And my son had um, silent reflux, so that was a whole situation. Um, and just my ability to deal with him when he was crying or uncomfortable, rather than getting really wound up and stressed about it, I was able to deal with it much better. And so it then became sort of a habit that I had to keep to because I couldn't control anything else. I couldn't control how my son felt or his condition or anything like that. We were doing our best, um, but I could control how I was in those situations. So that started lifting the fog 
and all of a sudden I wasn't a sort of spectator in autopilot in my life. I was actually starting to be a lot more active and, and involved in my toddler and my baby. And there becomes a point in your journey in fitness where fitness stops becoming just something that you personally experience and you enjoy, but something that you then actively expand and start helping other people with their fitness journey. So I know you started to take on um, a few clients while you were working yes. in time. Yeah. And something I'm really interested to know, what that was like for you at that time in terms of your mindset and your own motivations. It was never a business decision, funnily enough. I always call myself the accidental entrepreneur. <laughs> right, okay. um, I, I didn't think I was built for business. I did love my job. Um, so it was never a sort of, I want to do this as a business. But because my body had changed I had changed, my whole energy and vibe was different. I was this all of a sudden super positive, radiating person. Yeah. Um, that people were asking me, what, like, how did you do this? What are you doing? Can you help me? And so I started helping people. This was, you know, right at the beginning. And I just, I wanted others to feel as good as I did um, because it was friends and family. And you know how women don't generally like to ask for help. So when they say something like that, you know that they're going through something. Um, so I started helping them just, just for the sheer love of it. Yeah. Um, and then more and more people started asking and it was at that point that I was like, gosh, I, I maybe I should now actually qualify yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and do this properly because I'd taken complete care of my nutrition as someone who is very information and data driven. I absorbed any and all information I could to help me on my journey. Um, but I wasn't at that point qualified so I'd done it for myself I hadn't got any qualifications but as more and more people wanted my help I was like okay I should get qualified so I can help them properly now when sort of word of mouth got around do you start get, getting interest from people that weren't necessarily in your circle um it took a little while for that from the, the whole referral perspective to, people tend to be a little bit sort of um, quiet about them working on their own goals and dreams when they're, you know, if, if it's an area that they're particularly sensitive about. But the most um, sort of stranger, um, unconnected um, inquiries I got were from my social media because I actually started my social media way back in 2017. And I'm very anti-social media on a personal basis. Um, but I set up that account to hold myself accountable to all the things that I was doing to help me and my body progress um, and my health and fitness. And so it was never around the business, but I shared what I was doing, recipes, you know, motivation, um, tips and things like that. And so very, very slowly my following started increasing. And that is when people used to ask um, that, that were not connected to me um, to say, look, you know, I'd love to achieve what you're achieving. Would you would you help me? And there's, there's something about the parallels of social media that it is all about consistency as well and regular posting. Yeah. If you've got that I'm learning now, yeah. <laughs> so if you've got that mindset when it comes to social media, then yeah, that does tie in quite nicely if you're trying to hold yourself accountable. Absolutely. Right? Well, yeah. So you were working with clients and working full time for like a good what year and a half, two years before you quit your job. So it was, I started running kickboxing classes, um, instructing in 2016. Okay. End of 2016, um, all the way through 2017. It was 2019 that I quit my job. Interesting year to quit your job. Um, tell me about it. <laughs> Before. <laughs> a bit, we, yeah. we had no idea what was going to happen, right? Um, but it came to the point where I was getting a lot of inquiries. I couldn't take on many clients. And it's funny because at the time I quit my job, I only had five private clients. Right, okay. Um, but I knew that there was enough people out there. There were enough people that needed the help and that I had built up enough experience and knowledge and been getting great results um, with the people that I'd worked with so far. And I basically backed myself. And it's I'm, like, I'm going to tell you this. I, I don't think I've ever shared it before, but it was with my first business coach. Okay. But being in a big corporate environment, I was a project manager, I ran teams, you start understanding that mentoring, mentors and coaches are, you, know, it, it, you need them to progress in your career or wherever it is that you want to go in life. Um, so for me, it was really important. I got someone who was going to be able to help me. 
And it was my first business coach that was like, and I, I wasn't taking any paid clients at the time. It was all still all freebies, friends and family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't believe I had what it took um, to charge people. And he was like, by this time next month, you need to have at least three paying clients. And so that was the sort of first part of the the, the business and the service. Because you can't really call it a business if you're not making anything on it, right? If you're not charging. And um, so that was really empowering. Um, but it made me take that big, scary step. Um, and it was because of that, when I started being able to charge people, that I was like, I, I could actually do this. And it was taking so much time from, you know, I had work, full-time work, the kids, family, and the business, and the classes. I was like, I'm going to have to pick what is going to be most important to me. And as much as I loved my job and I was very good at it and the money was fantastic, like there was no reason for me to leave that job. But I, I do this thing called the deathbed thinking. Deathbed thinking, what's that? So I want to know that when I'm on my deathbed, whatever decision I've made at this point makes me proud when I'm lying there saying my goodbyes. And I just thought, when I'm on my deathbed, I want to leave knowing that I've left something good in the world with a whole bunch of people that are better because of what I've been able to help them do. I wasn't doing that in banking, let's be honest. <laughs> so as much as I enjoyed it, this was something that was like calling to my soul almost. Um, I had no idea if I would do well out of it, but it was just the sake of, okay, if it, I'm going to give it a shot. If it doesn't work, I've always got this to go back to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You've always got, luckily, you know, if you've built up a decent career and a network, that's always the plan B. But it was then the plan B. I wanted to focus on being able to impact others um, as my as my plan A. I'm just curious to know that you've got that on one side and you've got obviously all other things that are going on in your life, your personal life. Was, was there any doubts that was coming in in terms of leaving your job? Every day. I, no, not even every day, every moment of every day. Okay. Because there was, I, I think there was only one person in my life that really believed I could do it. And that's really tough because everyone is telling you no. And then I remember telling myself, look, every single point in your life, you have made choices that everyone's opposed and you've done it. You've nailed it. You've succeeded. Like my dad told me not to go into IT, not to do a computer-based um, degree, not to work for a bank. And every time I was like, no, I'm going to do it and followed my intuition. What I now know is my intuition. And um, it always worked out for me. So I had one of my best friends and he was like, do it. You're going to be fine. You know how amazing you are at this. And is this the one person you were saying in your life that was telling you to do it? Yeah, he was like, and, and actually it's funny because he's one of my uh, the coaches in my team. So, <laughs> but he was like, you're going to fly. I have no shadow of a doubt. Everyone else was so used to me being in that safe corporate role, just like they were, that they were like, don't do this. It's not, it's, it's too, too risky. And at this stage in your life, do you really want to start again? And because, you know, I had toddlers, I had um, a massive mortgage, we just had house renovations done. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is something I want to do. Whenever someone says, you can't do this, or you're not going to do well at it, it drives me even more so. And I want to prove that actually you, you're wrong. There's more in me than you think. So it's almost like there's that old uh, age old thing that we do where we're looking for validation, but there's, it, it drives us to show ourselves yeah. and, and, and basically show up for ourselves. Definitely. So that was like a big motivator for you. Huge. So going from leaving your job, having five clients, and then at that point, your business coach already said, you know, you've got to make, make those three clients. So you've done, you've done that and then you've got your five clients. And now you were looking to grow. So talk us through that next transition period. That transition has been humongous. I got really busy in this, at the end of summer 2019. And I had one of my clients had a fantastic transformation. And she basically went out there and recommended me to a whole bunch of people who... Yeah, and that was immense. Like, there's nothing like your work speaking for itself. You're not selling it. It's someone else who got the results going, you need to go and work with this person. So that made a really big difference. Um, and then so business started to pick up. And then obviously the pandemic happened. 
And I, I, I can't lie, it was a very scary time leading up to the pandemic because people were already starting to see, you know, that things were starting to change. But also my dad died on the first day of lockdown on the 23rd of March. And he had been one of those people that was um, very worried about me leaving my job, a stable job, and basically focusing on this solely on this business. And I told him, you watch, you watch what I do. And so when he died, it was almost like a, oh my God, you are here now and there's a pandemic and the world is basically shutting down and I've made a promise to you and now you're not here and I have to keep this promise to you. And so it, there was a lot of doubt that went through my mind and I was like, right, we either fold here or we have to, we have to find another way. And I literally had to dig deep and it was almost him passing that fueled the fire again where I think had that not happened I probably would have let myself be swept away with the pandemic and people being scared but actually I doubled down on the fact that now was the time to take control of your health especially with so many people sort of losing their lives to this to this virus um including close members of my family my own dad um so for me it was a case of um, let's let's make this happen. I, I needed to prove it to my dad um, and I needed to prove it to myself and I ended up getting some of my most amazing transformations and showcasing what could actually be done just from home yeah. with no gyms, hardly any equipment. Everyone was sold out of all the equipment. It's ironically how you first got into fitness as well, through home videos and then it's kind of come a bit full circle. Yes, exactly. Um, and people really had the time to to focus because they weren't being distracted by socials and being out and all the other things. Um, for a lot of people, it made a huge difference. And so, yeah, I grew and it get, got to the point where I was so busy. I had so many inquiries. I had a three month waiting list and I was like, I think it's time to bring someone on board the team. And that was a really scary point for me. Really scary. So this would be your first hire, and the first hire I'd hired for my corporate job. Yeah, for people to work on my teams. But you know, you've got a whole conglomerate, you've got a whole company of corporation behind you. Yeah, and there's your process is already in place. There's mission statement. There's job descriptions that have been signed off by HR. Exactly. So you're just vetting. You're your one stage of vet vetting, whereas I was hiring not just for someone to come and work with me. I was hiring for a business that I had built from scratch, from love and passion, and that my livelihood depended on. Yeah. So it was a very, very scary point for me. Um, and I talked myself out of it about a million times. <laughs> like I'm trying to find ways of continuing to be impactful in my business without bringing anybody on. And I think that's a struggle that a lot of people face. It goes from being like the self-employed person yep. to the entrepreneur and thinking a bit bit bigger in turn yep. where you want to be. I mean, did you have an idea at that time what your strategy was going to be or a long-term vision or were you sort of going with the flow? I was going with the flow. And any real entrepreneur is going to tell you that's completely the wrong way to do it. You always have to have a vision. But so far, this business had been hit by so many different variables since its inception that I almost had to go with the flow. So anything I would have planned would have almost knocked me off whatever path I was taking. So in, in a way, it was almost better that I was going with the flow. Um, but in terms of having a good structure towards the, a, a goal, I didn't have that. Um, and, and this is why even my... Um, my second business coach was like, you're a hustler. It's it's how you've managed to be successful is you are a hustler. You will adapt, bend and, and you know, change with whatever the business and the world needs. Um, so, yeah, that I recognized was going to be a member of a team being brought on. Um, and it did take me a little while to get my head around that and then yeah. find the right person. And funnily enough, it was a person that I started coming across at the gym. Right. Um, and she was already a PT and, you know, she was thinking about going on into the online space. A lot of people will sell money flexibility as, you know, the job. But actually, it's 
more so the space of, because I'd created this because I wanted to impact people. I needed someone who had the same values and the, the core values as I did. Yeah. Um, and had the vision for my business, which wasn't sort of by X years, I want to have made X amount of money or helped this amount of people. I wanted someone to go, to come into the business who was going to think like I did, where I want to leave someone in a much better position after they've finished working with me, feeling like they can genuinely be in a much better place in their life um, and actually care about the people that we work with um, and their results. And so this, this, my first coach, she was amazing. Like she, after lots and lots of meetings, she had to also um, feel like I was the right person for her to come on board with. Yeah, yeah. And I trained her. She is one of the most fantastic coaches um, and I've loved working with her. So she made it very easy for me to sort of start trusting in the process of bringing other people on board the team and growing the team. Anybody who sees you on social media and learns about, you know, you and, and how you approach your warriors, who I believe is what you call your clients, <laughs> um, you are such a big part of your brand personality. So when you do start bringing people on board, how do you ensure that that enthusiasm and that identity in your brand is still being maintained and personified? That's such a great question. It is very difficult. But the thing is, if I think people make a mistake in thinking that they should be hiring another version of themselves. And that is something I understood very quickly. Obviously, working in project management, you have to have different parts of the team doing different jobs to make sure you deliver the end goal. And so for me, I wanted to make sure that I'm not the perfect individual. I'm great at coaching, but I also have gaps in my knowledge or experience or, you know, any part of the business. And so I decided that if I was going to hire, it was going to be to fill those gaps. I see. So I and I, a degree of self-awareness is involved. There. Very much so. This is somebody who was older than me, who had three children, had been training for years, had a longer gym experience than I did that had been her life for the last, you know, 15 years. Um, and I'd been doing it as a side hustle for a few years. So she had a lot more face-to-face -face experience, which was fantastic because training, I adore it. And it's a massive part of what my business and the service does. Um, and I needed someone to have that level of experience to bring to, to the party, essentially. Um, and in terms of personality, is she to be fair, because I am the brand and it, it wasn't never planned for it to grow as a sort of business that was built a, a brand on me. Um, I wanted to just make sure that whoever came on board cared about the clients as much as I did and knew how to connect with them and get them the results that they wanted. So she didn't have to. Or, and no one coming on board needs to be another version of Tej. They need to be the best version of themselves and have a gross mindset to plug the holes that they may have. And also fill in the gaps that I have. So as a team, and, and that's why the team that we have now is is very diverse and we all have our different specialisms. So when we're together as a team, we are covering so many bases. I'm thinking more for people who are in that phase now where they're looking to expand and grow their team. How does one become aware of their own blind spots so that they can then go and find people to essentially compensate for that? Experience. Um, but also I have had a couple of business coaches and it's good because we're not very objective about our own selves. We can be self-aware, but we have limitations. Every one of us, like we, <laughs> we always are blinkered uh, we, and, and we operate from our strengths. But in order to, and we can do that when we are a part of a big team working for somebody else as an employee. But when you are running a business if you want it to be successful, yeah. you have to be willing to look at your weaknesses and then either grow in that area or employ in that area. It's very useful to bring in somebody who's going to help you be more objective about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, this first hire wasn't that as much so. I just needed another coach so that we could carry on helping people come on board and get the results. Um, but then I did bring somebody else on board who would help more so with the business side of things. Um, so the background running the admin and things like that. Right. Okay. Um, and although I can do that, it's something that was necessary for someone else to take on board so that I could focus on my strengths, which is bringing on clients and coaching. Um, and so you have to be aware of your weaknesses so that you can make sure that you build a robust uh, business 
When it comes to trying to achieve that scale and growth in your business, what are some of the things that you have had to upskill within yourself to try and handle that growth? So upskilling um, in terms of sort of the other business areas that need attention, I'll be honest, I employ for those areas. So, you know, the finance side, all of those kind of things. Um, I have to say I had to upskill in my social media game. Okay. Um I, when I, I, I have promised myself that when I am making enough money in the business, that's the first thing I will hand over. Because like I said at the beginning, I'm not naturally a fan of social media. It's an imperative part of the business. That's that's why I have it. Um, and if, if I want to stay true to my, my vision of impacting as many people as possible, it's going to be the biggest way to do that, to be visible. And why aren't you a fan of it? I'm just a very private person. Oh, okay. So it's that balance. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a, I, I, I mean, obviously, people see a lot of my life now on my stories and things. And I do tend to talk about things more. But I don't share everything. I am very private. I don't share my children. You know, I share things that they say and interactions and what I cook for them, for example. But my, my family and my life are very private because they're sacred to me. Um, and this is my business. And, and yes, I'll, I'll let things bleed a little bit but I have my boundaries for that um and that was one of the reasons I was never a fan of social media because I was always like people if they really want to know you and what know what's going on in their in your life they need to be a part of your life and I don't want you just watching from 22 miles away on my social media to see what I'm getting up to I don't we don't need more noisy na nosy neighbors <laughs> <laughs> um so that was where where my head was at but actually now I see social media as, as not just necessary for the business, but people to understand what I'm about, that I am actually a normal person who is living, breathing, doing the kind of things that they can do and achieve in their own lives and sort of businesses and, and bodies. Um, so it, I'm less, I'm not so anti-social media as I used to be, but I'm not na the na most natural person with it. Um, so I did have to do a social media course and understand how to edit certain things oh god it's so painful <laughs> it's like another job it is and so I still will hand off those skills to somebody who's more so um skilled in that area um in the future but obviously the brand is me so I do need to still be present and and on it um and so that was one area um, but all the other areas are m much easier to sort of um, employ for. So like I said, the finance area. And I did get, like I said, um, business coaches. I've had a couple of business coaches to help me to be able to focus on the areas that will allow me to get the most impact out of my business. And it's interesting. You mentioned business coaches quite a few times yeah. on this podcast. And am I right in saying that you are have hired business coaches at different points in your business for specific reasons? Yes. So can you share some of those challenges that you were facing at the time before you hired a coach that made you want to go look for some additional support? So the first realm was obviously the fact that I didn't have the confidence to actually get paying clients. <laughs> um, so there were some barriers to be broken down then. And like I said, accountability for everything. Um, any good coach is going to hold you accountable for actions to get you towards where you want to be. But you've got to know where you want to be. So getting clients first was my first port of call and my first coach he did help me to do that um as my business progressed he was no longer equipped to help me because I'd you know already done all the things and taken his advice up to that point um and at that point it was really important for me to find another coach who was going to be able to help my business grow um from the pandemic onwards the second set of coaching I went through was actually group coaching which for me, I, I mean, I, it's not that I have anything against group coaching at all. I think it's fantastic. And especially if you want to find a great network of people to sort of in the business world as well. Um, but certain individuals do like that more so one-on-one -on -one attention and know that they need somebody who's going to hold them accountable. Group coaching, I think I did that for about a year. And then my current coach is more so focused around, you know, growing my business as a fitness business. Um, and calls me out regularly because I naturally in the business, in a business that you love and that you're emotionally tied to, you're going to 
focus on things that aren't necessarily going to give you the most impact for your time and effort. Um, and you're more emotionally tied. So your your decisions and actions are more emotionally driven. Um, it's taking me a while to shed that. And I am quite an emotional person. I am emotionally driven. And I find that the more self-growth I did, I became even more so um, emotionally aware of myself. And so it, it becomes an even bigger thing to sort of detach yourself and make decisions that are less emotion driven and more business driven. Um, and as I said, like I am not the most natural business person. So anyone out there who's listening thinking I would invest in this person, they probably won't because I keep saying this. <laughs> I'm not a natural business person, but what I am is determined to um, grow from where I am, whether it's personally or in my business. I will get things wrong about a million times, but I'm willing to say, okay, I got this wrong and th this is where I was an issue. Here is my part in this and here is what I can now do to grow from that. Um, so that, you know, it's it's been very, very useful. In fact, I'd say crucial for me to have mentors and business coaches. And coaches can be quite expensive. Mm. And so is there anything that we should look out for to make sure that we're making the right decision they're not there to make you happy they're there to get you to those goals and sometimes they're going to have to call you out um but you've also got to trust in this person um and believe in what they are saying they will be able to do with you uh like i spend a lot of time watching them for a long time and seeing how they impact others okay. before. Because I want to see the proof. It's like when I put my transformations side by side, yeah. people out there looking for co coaches or thinking of working on themselves, they want to see, are you actually producing the results? You could be the nicest person in the world. Tej, I really like you. You're so energetic. You're so positive. But if I wasn't producing the results, would they want to work with me? Okay. So it's the same thing with a business coach. If they're not producing the results... You could, they could be your best friend. It's not worth investing. I've invested uh, eye-watering sum of money <laughs> in, in business coaches. Um, and and they, it does pay off. If it doesn't pay off in you getting to where you want to be, it will pay off in a lot of education and growth and under, getting even more specific about what you do need. So this is a question from a listener, from a listener from the fitness community as well. Amazing. I've recently become a qualified PT amazing, and I want to start taking on clients outside of my full-time job. Sounds familiar. <laughs> and, um, what is the best way to get regular clients, even though I don't have previous examples to show for? I'm really passionate about getting results for people and helping them achieve their fitness goals, but feel like my lack of experience is holding me back from getting clients. Is there any advice you have should I charge less? Okay. So first, when I first started PTing, I didn't charge anything. I literally charged nothing because I wanted to show myself that I could do it and apply. For me, the practical is so much more than the than the, the learnings. The, I'll be very honest. In the fitness world, the PT level three qualification is the lowest barrier of entry. It literally teaches you nothing about an individual that will be of value. It is only getting to work with people hands-on that will allow you to become a bona fide PT, a, an actual trainer. And I'll, I'll go as far as to saying turning you into a coach because you, you have to coach individuals through movements, through their training, through their low points, through the sort of, I can't do anymore. So... You have to recognize the fact that if you don't have transformations or results, that's okay. But you have to be willing to put in the time to spend on being passionate. And that sometimes does mean you don't get anything of monetary value back. You won't be paid for your service. But what you're getting is a whole bunch of experience. It's like doing work experience at school, right? Um, and I did that for a while. And all my friends and family that I did PT, they didn't pay me. And it was only later, I think, when I'd been PTing some of them for, you know, three, four months and they were starting to see results that they offered. And even then I was like, yeah, sure, just pay me 20 pounds a session. <laughs> and now I think about it, like, 
I would. I wish I'd had someone in my world that had been able to give me twenty pound sessions. You do need to get to know pe- different people's bodies, different bodies, the way they move. Those contraindications they teach you about in the qualifications is nothing like what you'll see on in an actual live person in front of you. You need to go out there and practice your craft and get really, really good at it. And that is exactly what I did. And if you truly love it, like this individual says, they love it. I, I'm that. This industry needs more of those people who are so passionate about it that they actually want to make a difference in people's lives. Then they're going to have to be willing to invest that time without the monetary payback because it will pay back. When it comes to something that you know now that's been really pinnacle to your journey that you didn't know at the start of your journey, what would that be? Oh, that's a difficult question because if you were to remove the word pinnacle... Okay. I would say that the toughest part of my journey has been not recognizing at the beginning when I started my business how all consuming it would be. Okay. Yeah. It is all consuming. And you have to be able to set super strong boundaries in place so that it doesn't overtake your life. And I'm going to put my hand up to the fact that multiple times that it my business life bleeds all over everything else. And it tends to take priority. Um, and that's not always a good thing. I have to say that one of the reasons I have, um, I had one of my business coaches was because the the what I wanted to achieve was with them was a better work-life balance. It was nothing to do with growing the business. It was actually me recognizing the fact that I didn't want this business to take over my life. Because sometimes you can get so passionate and driven about something that it becomes your sole focus. And... Coming from that extremely determined, hyper-independent background where, no, I can do this myself. I can do this. You know, if anyone says I can't do it, I've got to do it. It almost becomes um, a burden because it stops you from making space for the other stuff in your life. Um, So in that respect, there are elements of my employee lifestyle that I miss because You don't just get to walk out of the office to go and pick up your children and then have the evening to... And weekends. And weekends free. You do not get that privilege unless you have very, very strong boundaries and your business is robust enough and your team is robust enough. I'm on the way there. I'm not there yet. So it's going to be a journey. Um, But in the interest of being completely transparent, I think you're very right. It's important to talk about this. It's a prison if you let it be. There's only one person holds the key to that door and it's you. And that's why for me, again, I I know I've spoken about business coaches a lot. It's because I know that those are the type of things that a coach is helping me specifically with so that I don't become, you know, completely glued to business and that my life completely disappears on the sidelines. Um, I've got children, I've got family, you know, I I do what I'm, I'm I'm only 40. So it's great if you have a business that's making you money, but it's no. there's no point if it doesn't then give you the freedom to enjoy the things that you want to and achieve outside of that as well. And so how do you get those boundaries? I, I have set the boundaries. I don't work on the weekends. Um, you know, if it's a bit of content creation or something like that, I try to make it fun so that it's not so, you know, work. Yeah. You know, I can have my kids buzzing around or doing videos and it almost becomes a part of our fun time. Yeah. And, and also weekends as well. I have harder switch off times. Um, and I focus sort of sales calls on certain days and times of the week. You described yourself as being quite a determined person (laughs) and a high performance individual as well. Where does that come from? Um, not the nicest of places as, as it goes. Um, when I've dug deeper, I'm very big into being self-aware and self-growth and self-healing. Um, and that's what allows me to be the best coach I can be and help as many people as possible. Um, and it turns out that, like, I come from a very non-emotional household um, and a very humble household. My parents did their absolute best with what they had. Um, and their upbringing was also very unemotional. So from that perspective, and also the fact that they'd had real hardships in their lives. So, you know having a good job, having stability, focusing on academics. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in our culture and, and many others out there who can resonate with this where they've come from humble 
backgrounds where all the focus was put on being academically brilliant and achieving and being the top of everything. And so they put that on you. And I always felt like I wasn't a worthy individual because I, you know, I went to a private school that I didn't want to go to, had a horrible secondary school sort of few years um, that wasn't the right environment for me. I was a very intelligent, bright girl, but it wasn't the environment that was nurturing for who I was. Yeah. Um, and then at home, it was very, pre same type of pressure as at school. So I do believe had I been put in the right environment, I probably would have been even more so academically successful. But what I'm also very aware of is that it made me more resilient. Um, and from that resilience, I wanted to prove that the fact that I didn't have to come from the same background as somebody else or have the same abilities as somebody else to be successful. I then went to a very mediocre university um, and I did one of the toughest degrees. I did computer science and out of a mass of over 400 students, there was about 20 females in the whole course. And the lecturer told us on my very first day, out of all of these students, only one out of every three of you will graduate. And even less so, there would only be about 25% of the females here. Oh, wow. And I was one of those. So I made it. I made it and I was actually really good at a lot of it. And it just more so reminded me that you're, you are your only boundary. You are your only limitation. So it doesn't matter where you've come from. You can absolutely hit the ceiling, hit the sky and, and smash through it if you start breaking beyond your barriers. And, and like this podcast is actually one of them because recording in person on a, on a podcast, it's something that this time last year I would never have dreamt of. Yeah, yeah. And for those people who want to learn a bit more about you and find you on your socials. <laughs> Not on my socials. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean direct. yeah. Yeah. directly. Directly, um, they can find me at Tej underscore fit on Instagram. Um, I also am present on Facebook, but I operate my, mostly from my Instagram. Um, I have a website and that's just simply tejfit.com. <laughs> um, otherwise, if you ever bump into me in person, then please come and say hi. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. I, thank you so much for inviting me. Like, this has been the first non health and fitness related podcast that I've been invited to. And I've, as much as I was scared, I was so excited because it, I can talk about a whole different perspective of, of the business and what I do. So I'm, I, I'm so grateful that you've given me a chance to open up about that. Oh, thank you. <laughs>